Welcome to Plastic Fantastic, the first UK podcast marrying non-surgical and surgical treatments. Brought to you by Adrian Richards and myself, Alison Telfer. We're going to interview the great, the fantastic, the fabulous and all of those around our environment that have had some influence or work within anything to do with plastic surgery and non-surgical. We hope you enjoy the journey, come with us and let's meet some fascinating characters on the way. So today, Alison and I are absolutely delighted to welcome to the show Millard Shadru, the singing dentist, also known as SD or Dr. Millard or Dr. Mill, also known as Al. Dr. Mill, licensed to drill. I'm so excited. We're absolutely delighted. This guy is an entertainer from your back teeth to your front teeth. So let's just get on with it and learn all about Dr. Mill. Hello. Good morning. Hello, guys. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so, yes, what an intro. Thank you. That was that was wonderful. Um, Dr. Mill, licensed to drill, and Phil. And Phil. Uh, and today we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about your background. We're going to talk your, about your practice. We're going to talk about your fame, how you became famous online as the singing dentist. And we're talking about music and family. We're going to cover everything, aren't we, Al? Yeah, and even a bit of orthodontics, perhaps, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So what should we start with, Mill? Um, well, I guess let's let's start with kind of why I became SD, how I became SD, the singing dentist, and I guess all of that. So um, I've been a dentist 16 years. I qualified in 2004, but prior to that, um, I was very much involved with music. My father's a musician. I kind of grew up with music always in the house, and he plays piano, and he was a producer in Iran. So I'm originally Iranian. I was born in Iran, and I came to the UK when I was five, and um, music was a massive part of the house. So. I always had that affinity to it and I could kind of play keys and I'd listen to something I could figure out and play and I can play drums and things like that. So yeah, just, I did a lot of music growing up and in school and I started performing and then there was a, there was an industry in the UK called a genre, sorry, called the UK garage scene. So UK garage, garage was a big music and I was an MC in the garage kind of scene. And then I started DJing as well. And I was on radio stations and clubs and all that kind of stuff. But even through uni at dental school, I was still doing that. So it was always a part of what I did. And then fast forward, I think, so I qualified 2004, fast forward like eight years. One day, a patient didn't turn up for root canal of all things. And so I had about 45 minutes on my hands and then a song came on the radio and I just started freestyling, kind of rapping along to it because I could always do that. And talking about root canal and how no one likes it and how patients hate it. And as dentists, we don't like it much either. And then <laughs> I, thought it was quite, I thought it was quite funny. And I started videoing myself on my phone doing it. And then I just sent it to a friend of mine who's also a dentist. And he was like, dude, you have to put this online. I was like, mate, don't do that. That's silly. Dentists aren't supposed to act like this. Don't be, don't, be, don't be daft. But then he posted it without me knowing. So he put it into like a Facebook group full of dentists. They started liking it and sharing it. And then more people started seeing it. And then I really saw the response. I was like, oh, okay. A lot of the comments were like, oh my God, this is so funny. I don't know what he's talking about. Because I use a lot of terminology, right? I was like, I don't know what he's talking about, but this is hilarious. So I thought, okay, well, let's see if we can use that musical side of me and the dental side and actually make something to kind of give some oral health advice, make it fun, show a different side to dentists, because historically people don't like the dentist. They think we're all horrible people there to hurt them and maim them. So um, I did the first official one, and that the first one I actually penned and sat down and wrote was uh, Gappy, which was a parody of Happy by Pharrell Williams. At the mm -hmm. time, that was like globally the biggest record across the world. Everyone knew that record. Kids knew it, adults knew it. So I thought, okay, Happy is a great song to do. Um, gappy. So I kind of did the chorus and you might be gappy if you don't brush your teeth for two minutes twice a day, etc. And I recorded it and I created the character, the singing dentist, put it on a YouTube page and that was it. It did really well. People liked it. I thought, okay, well, let's keep doing them. And here we are five years later, I'm still doing them as and when I kind of feel there's a need, I'll do a new one. So I just saw your new one, the PPE with the Bee Gees. <laughs> that was a really good one. And I think your Ed Sheeran is probably one of your most famous ones. Absolutely. So I mean, the, the way that then it kind of grew. So I, would, I was very aware that it's a kind of niche thing I'm doing, you know, writing songs about teeth and parodying the way I do. Now, if you go on YouTube, you can find loads of dental parodies. Loads of people have done it. And it's quite a popular thing in America, especially with universe dental uni. So they're like, end of year kind of you know thing they do they all will do a song or whatever but it's very much like a big production you know they properly go to town on it with mine it's me and my phone in selfie mode one take 
in my surgery. So I never pause, I never edit. I've done a couple of different creatives along the way now, but it was always just me and my face and my lyrical ability <laughs> and delivery. And singing wise, I think it works that I'm a terrible singer because if I actually nailed every note, then it might be a bit too serious. You know, the fact that I, I sort of can't sing that well, I think works, I can rap, but the singing part of it, yeah. But I think that works. So the Ed Sheeran, so basically as it, as it kind of grew up, I, I would do them every so often like if a big song would come out. So the one after the happy was a parody of Cheerleader by Omi. Ooh, I think that I found myself a sweet eater. That's what I called it. <laughs> <laughs> and I talked all about eating sweets. There's always a new hole when I see her. That was the lyric. And um, <laughs> then I left it again another three months because I was waiting for the next one. Then summertime came and Despacito was mm. like globally. And even now, it's I think the most viewed video ever on YouTube, like 6 billion views or something. So I thought Despacito, I have to do this because it's huge. What can I do? What can I do? Okay, take a Cito. And so <laughs> I talked about patients coming in and take a Cito. I heard you broke your tooth eating a Dorito. And <laughs> it, it continued from there. And I actually got my Spanish friend to help me write it because I can't speak Spanish. So he gave me some Spanish words and that was a hard one to do. So I would purposefully do one and then wait and then kind of let it sort of die down again and then come with another one and it'll sort of go viral, etc. So I had a couple of virals um, with big pages posting them. So Lad Bible, Uni Lad, those type of huge pages. And, and then a couple of my videos had like 15 million views, 20 million views on those type of platforms. And then I started getting some TV work. My, my nurse basically wrote to the local paper. So my clinic's in Basingstoke and she wrote to the Basingstoke Gazette. They came along and did a little story on me about the parodies I was doing. Literally, it was like a Tuesday they came in. On the Wednesday, I was in the Metro newspaper, which is like a free paper in London, you know, that everybody gets on the underground. The following Thursday morning, BBC News came to the practice and did a piece on me. And then that Friday, I was on ITV London News and live. And then the following Thursday, Dr. Hillary talked about me on Lorraine. The following week, he was away on holiday. So they called me up and said, look, do you want to come and do like a dental edition? live on like the health section we do i was like blimey okay and this is live tv i've never done telly in my life and i kind of turned up there and it's so it's very surreal for those people that don't know how it kind of works you just turn up you sit in a room called the green room it's not green and then they mm -hmm. basically say yeah so you're gonna be live um here's some questions see you later and they kind of just walk off and you're like right okay and then you sort of bring you on bring you on mic you up and off you go and so I actually really enjoyed it. I loved it and I actually came across really well considering it was my first ever time. And then after that, like two weeks later, there was a new story about teeth. So I was the guy on Good Morning Britain and then this morning and it kind of just keeps snowballing. Once you get that kind of positioning, you become the guy. And so any dental stuff, they'd wheel me out. So that, <laughs> that kind of helps to keep it going. wheeling you out, but they've discovered you through singing, but they're wheeling you out. But then exactly, and actually, to be fair, every piece I did then on telly, what, it came across really well because dentists, again, they were always, you know, the scary guys, right? So the way we would do it was just before the advert or whatever, they'd get me, I'm coming up next to the singing dentist and I'd kind of do a little eyebrow wiggle or sing a little ditty. And then after the break, I'd get serious and talk about dentistry. So, you know, the, the medical health side would come out, but then it was always with a bit of fun stuff. And because of just my personality, even with doing the medical stuff, I'd always kind of bust a joke or do something or give a little look to the camera or whatever it was. So it was kind of something that hadn't really been done that way before, especially talking about teeth, which is terrifying for a lot of people. I was just about to say, and I know I'm, I'm allowed to say this because I'm married to a dentist and I've always teased him and basically said, dentists come out the same box as accountants normally. So they came out of that same box. Everything's, <laughs> pro, everything's straight, everything's controlled. You only have to count to a certain number and then your job is done because it's only so many. And so to have a character come out of that, you know, because your dentist doesn't usually talk to you, doesn't usually entertain you. They're not real people. They're just people who take your money and give you fillings. So that's what I guess is so appealing, is the character in you. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And I think that because it has that double side with the kind of musical element, which is always educational and positive and fun, but then there is substance behind it. So in all the lyrics, they're not just talking nonsense. If you actually listen to them, there's always a, a, an either oral health message, a safety message, a, a, an educational, there's something behind each one. And I kind of take time to write them so that because of the music side of what I do, I can, I can write, it's actually not even a parody, it's, it's a pastiche. So that, that's music, parodies, act, uh, a film kind of version of something. But yeah, so with those, 
I, I take the original and then I stick so closely to, to the wordplay of the original, but I'm using other words that when you hear it, it kind of, you still think, oh, this sort of sounds normal, but it's not. He's telling me about teeth. Why am I enjoying it? I shouldn't be. This is terrible. He's ruined the original for me, but I quite like it. So that, <laughs> that's sort of the vibe with it. And the Ed Sheeran was, a, was the one that blew up for me. And that, Took a long time to write. I knew I had to do it because when he came back, that was, again, the globally biggest record. And Shape of You, I struggled for a bit to think, how can I parody Shape of You? I kept, it kept coming up, shave your tooth. I'm like, that's not nice. We don't want to talk about that. <laughs> and, it, and it was my wife that kind of screamed from the other room one day when I was thinking about it. She was like, save your tooth. And I thought, oh, there you go. That's a good one. So then I wrote it all about saving teeth and how we're not horrible people. And that one did big, big numbers. That really kind of then escalated me to a, another level of kind of global virality and that one that one was the big one that opened a lot of doors for me yeah and mill that was your biggest one was it could you give us a little little, little sample well, of that one just a little light i'm not sure how it must feel though knowing that you're a global virus we've got one of those around at the moment <laughs> absolutely yeah um yes give, virality give some... is a strange thing isn't it yeah. um so the ed sheeran one uh so my job is to save your tooth so brush and floss like you need to do you get toothache i'm here for you I'm here to help everybody. And last night you had Linda Lou. And now your breath kind of smells like poo. Every day when you brush, scrape your tongue too. That is good oral hygiene. Oh, I, oh, I. And it carries on from there. So, <laughs> yes. And, but that one, yeah, that one was, was big. Actually, even on my own YouTube channel, that's done like nearly 4 million views, I think. But on Facebook and other kind of social platforms at the time, every page shared it. I think I... I totted it all up from almost everything I could see. And I think that one alone did about 150 million views across all different platforms. That was crazy. And that then got shared in every other country. I did interviews. I did like a live Australian telly. I did live German telly. Um, I had a phone call off the Ellen show off the back of that one. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't travel at the time because, because I was born in Iran. Um, traveling to the States at that time because of a certain uh, ruling from a certain president was unable to happen. So that, that kind of poo-pooed things a bit. But anyway, uh, moving on. So, but yeah, that one, that one really did well. And um, Ed Sheeran himself heard it and they, they interviewed him about it on BBC Radio News, Radio One News. And he mentioned, yeah, he sort of heard it, thought it was really cool. Then I got a call from like his team. He was doing a show at the Royal Albert Hall for the Teenage Cancer Trust. And they invited me to the show backstage and I went along and I kind of sang my version for the kind of, you know, people backstage that were from the Teenage Cancer Trust. And then Ed kind of was walking past me. And then I saw, we, we sort of glanced like, a, all right. And he went, all right. And he sort of came back and went, you're the singing dentist. I was like, yeah, I am. And he came over and we had a nice chat. He was such a lovely guy. And he said, let's have a picture. I was like, okay. So we took a photo and he was just a really nice dude. And, you know, I, I could not believe it that he had seen it, first of all. Secondly, he liked it and actually was so nice about it. So yeah, it's, it's always a surreal moment when the artist you've parodied kind of, has kind of heard it and approves. So yeah. Yeah, because they could be a bit annoyed, couldn't they? Now, Mill, a question here. Now, all this work, all this fame, you know, you, you've got notoriety. How does that work with your serious side, which is, which is a dental practice? So my patients, because I've, I've been at the same clinic since I qualified. So um, from 2004, I've been there and I took over ownership of it in 2010. Um, and my patients, they've been very loyal to me from the, from day one. And I've always been this type of person. So the singing, the singing dentist character isn't really like something I turn on and turn off. I'm just kind of that way anyway. Um, I don't obviously sing everything and wiggle my eyebrows a lot, but it does mm -hmm. come out. Um, and I'm just quite a kind of bubbly, positive person anyway. So my patients were always used to that type of personality. And actually when they started to see it on TV and see it in the papers and media and stuff, they were all like, Oh my God, that's my dentist. And they're actually quite happy at the fact that they were my dentist and then I started getting new patients coming because I guess of what I was doing I was showing like a more personal side of dentistry and that for lots of people you know I was getting loads of comments like oh I wish my dentist was like you I was like well they might be it's just maybe they don't feel like they can show that or you know oh I've just seen my dentist he told me I need this 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 what do you think I was like dude I have no idea I've got no x-rays, I haven't seen in your mouth. Like, if you're worried, why don't you just ask him? Ask your dentist again and say, look, I'm a bit unsure about that. Can you explain a bit better? And I'm sure they will. It's just a lot, you know, they felt comfortable talking to me and coming to see me. I guess also because it wasn't in a clinical environment. So, you know, everyone gets a bit more nervous when they, they see the, the, the PPE, the clothes, and they're in a surgery. But talk, talking to me on their mobile phone from their living room is just probably a bit easier. So I guess because of that element, 
I was just more approachable. And that reflected then into my, into my clinical work because even the patients that knew me from before, they were a bit more, they'd come in and be like, oh, you're going to sing me a song? You're going to mm-hmm. sing a song? Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of brought us closer. But then there are elements where I got a lot busier. So there'd be days when, I mean, you know, with TV, especially those type of journalistic shows like Good Morning Britain, This Morning, these type of things that really reflect, reflect current affairs, they'll literally call you like 11 o'clock p.m. and say, hi, we've just heard there's a new story breaking tomorrow. Can you come in? And I'm like, dude, it's 11 o'clock. Like, I've got to shave this nugget now. Are you, what, what? <laughs> like, yes, but what time? Oh, we'll send a cab for you at five. Five, that's six hours. I'm in bed. <laughs> <laughs> so you, I'm literally like shaving my head like one o'clock in the morning, sort of getting ready to go on telly. And people don't kind of see that side. And you rock up there and you've had like 35 Red Bulls and two cups of coffee. Your stomach is churning now as well because you shouldn't have had that many Red Bulls. And then you're, you're suddenly on live telly. And then I have to cancel a morning, you know, on short notice. I, my receptionist then has to call the patient and say, guys, I'm so sorry. You know, Dr. Mills in ITV studios now. So he's not going to be able to come in this morning. Now, if I didn't have an amazing patient base with very understanding of that, it would have caused a lot of problems. But majority of the time, they're like, oh, I'll tune in, as opposed to being you know, annoyed that I'm not there. So I'm very lucky. I've had a good patient base. They've been really super supportive. And off the back of it, I've got busier. When I didn't kind of want to get busier, that was never the need. This was not, it actually sort of annoys me sometimes when I see comments on stuff I do. This guy's a marketing genius. You know, I wish I'd thought of this as a marketing tactic. I was like, dude, this was never a marketing thing. Like I didn't sit there and go, hmm, how can I get more patients? Let me start singing about teeth. It just happened accidentally, organically. And then I, I guess I see that side. Yes, it would have been a great marketing thing, but it was never, it was never about that. And, it's never, and if you look, I've never once ever told people, come to my clinic. Not in one video in five years have I said that. Not once have I tagged my clinic in any video. It just organically happens because people then want to come and see you. So And that's the way I think, you know, it works the best when it's organic and it's sincere and it's authentic, then people respond to that way more than if you try and plan something. And, you know, I just don't think it comes across well. Yeah, I agree with that. It's difficult to to simulate that to authenticity, Mills. So can you quickly tell us now, can you explain, this is a challenge for you, Mills, can you explain cosmetic dentistry? What are the options in one minute? Go. Go. So... Cosmetic dentistry, um, it's a way of basically changing elements of your mouth, your teeth, your smile that you don't like, whether it's crooked teeth, whether it's the color of your teeth, whether it's the shape of your teeth. Um, And there's lots of different options, whether it's missing teeth that affect the way you smile. So loads of different options. In the world of the kind of aesthetic smile makeover thing, there's really two main ways of doing it. The first is with veneers. Um, veneers now come in different materials they've always kind of had but it's much better much more kind of predictable now you can have porcelain you can have composite which is like the white filling material disadvantages and advantages of both but your good smile dentist would be able to give you all the options and look and see what's kind of the best thing for you another way is using orthodontics it's a kind of method that you know people have coined abc which is aligning bleaching and then contouring i call it some people call it bonding abb but essentially alignment you use braces to move the teeth into a better position you then do some bleaching or tooth whitening on them to improve the color and then the final phase is the contouring where you even up the shapes whether it's adding a bit here taking a bit off there you might then use veneers in that final stage you might just use composite the filling material so those are the kind of two main ways of making changes to your aesthetics um but it's very customized and it's very bespoke per person because one person's view of aesthetic cosmetic beauty is very different to another person's and you have to appreciate that and really delve into the personality of the person delve into the reasons why they're doing that delve into that emotional attachment from wanting to make a change then you can offer them the very best options for them to achieve the goals brilliant that might have been over a minute but (laughs) No, uh, no, I, no. I, I hope that explained it. Yeah. I think it's perfect. And I think, I think what people are terrified of, and this is the same in our industry, you know, people are terrified of having massive boobs or massive lips or bad Botox. People are terrified of looking like, oh, who's that chap? Is it Rylan? The chap who's had... Rylan, yes. Or just people are just terrified of having really bad looking veneers that were perhaps done years ago. But I think you can do it. And I think people are doing it. Oh, do you know I had orthodontics probably five or six years ago? I just had a train track for nine months because I just had one tooth that slightly moved. So I, I don't think there's ever, I think you can do it whenever. 
Okay. Absolutely, yeah, and, and adult orthodontics is very, very, very popular now. So the, the traditional like train track things, you know, that here on the in the UK, our children can get on the National Health Service for free if they qualify and meet the requirements. That's kind of when you say braces, everyone's like, oh, train track, bleh. but that's not. It's come it's come full on so much as well. There's clear kind of aligner based stuff. There are sort of ceramic bracket um, braces that don't look like a whole load of metal in your mouth. You can even have the train tracks placed on the inside of your teeth now. So you can't even see them at all. Yeah. yeah. So there's lots of options. Yeah. So one of the things I've noticed more, and Al's pointed it out, doing these podcasts and videos and Zooms, that my teeth, I never noticed how bad my teeth were, but you, you do notice them. Have you noticed that, um, uh, Mill, that more people yeah. are coming in because of the seeing themselves online? massively we are staring at ourselves way more than we ever did the selfie the creation of that forward-facing camera on your phone has meant we stare at ourselves so much more and actually because of social media also we're staring at other people so much more and people that we want to emulate and people that we want to be like so when you see these heroes of yours these influencers these content creators actors whatever it is when you see them and you think oh i'd like to look like that you then look at them, you look at yourself, you look at them, you look at yourself, and you start picking holes in yourself in the areas that you don't look like that. And the smile, the teeth is definitely something. And actually, because again, of all the resources available online, patients are way more educated now. They are way more kind of, not, gone are the days when they come in and go, just do what you like, doc. That doesn't happen. They come in now and they're like, dude, make me look like this. I've done 35 uh, hours of research and I know that my best option is composite bonding. So can you do that? You're like, blimey, all right. And then sometimes those become the most difficult conversation and you're like, dude, actually that's probably not the best option for you. And then you kind of need to sort of let, change the way they're thinking about themselves. And a lot of the time they'll get it. Sometimes they don't and they'll just go find someone else who will do it. And even if that might not be necessarily the best thing for them. So that's when I think things get a bit, tricky and a bit murky and it's also times where you have to learn to say no so if someone comes in with a picture of a horse and says can you make my teeth look like this <laughs> that's what al did i think yeah I, <laughs> I think that's when you kind of have to look at that and go mm, I, don't, I don't think i can and i'm afraid i don't have the skill set to meet your expectations or requirements and you very kindly do the handshake and walk to the door yeah. Um, and because it's a difficult one and that I think comes with experience that comes with training that comes with that inner gut feeling when the patient sort of walks in and within the first 10 20 30 seconds you make an assessment of their kind of personality type and think oh this 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 has got some alarm bells it's got some little red flags for me here so either you can work through those and bring the patient on a, a, a journey that you're both happy with and you have that rapport in order to do that or it's just never going to work. And I think at those times, experience then tells you, listen, the best thing is to say, I think I wish you all the best and that's not for me. Move really. on. So there's a couple of things. I mean, we, it's absolutely fascinating talking to you. And, and a couple of things I'd like to know is number one, about your family a little bit more. Number two, about your music uh, a little yeah. bit more. Number three, sure. about the future. And finally, Al, do you think Mill would give us a little, little pastiche a medley of his songs at the end? <laughs> questions as well is one could, I will, we'll do the question but one of my questions is one you don't have to ask for any type of permission or anything to do someone to use someone's music do you i don't know and also i want to know what you how does your nurse put up with you, <laughs> you know and i don't know my husband always used to say this that my so i always used to say to my husband oh, i don't know how your nurse does this all day with you and then his nurse always used to say to him I don't know how Alison puts up with you. So I think you sometimes <laughs> keep your nurse very similar to your wife in some ways. And the other thing is, is I need a new dentist because my husband doesn't practice anymore. So maybe I'll come down to Basin State. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. So on the third point, anytime, more than happy. Um, so with the, with the permission side, so fair usage is a law that permits you to use um, someone's song material, do a parody of it or a pastiche of it or a cover of it. As long as then you don't directly monetize that without having a conversation with them to decide what is fair. So I never monetize any of my videos. So when I upload them onto YouTube, I don't click monetization. Um, same with Facebook or anything else. And very quickly, whenever I put them up, I get a copyright claim. Because it has a large audience of people see it, I'll get a copyright claim. That claim is in no way an infringement. It's not telling you off. It just says, hey, 
our algorithm has picked up that Sony BMG owns the rights to this song, and now they're going to make the money off of it. Now, I could argue that and go, actually, well, no, because my parody is bringing extra views to you. So I think I deserve 50% of that income you're getting. And then their lawyer will get in touch with me. And several thousand pounds later, after my lawyer talks to them, I might make a couple of hundred quid off that view. So it's just not worth it for me to ever engage in a fair usage back and forth with a you know, huge label like Universal, Time Warner, or Sony BMG. So for me, these are educational. They are a way of getting me seen by a lot of the people, which then helps me in other aspects of what I'm doing. So I've never kind of seen it as I need to monetize these. Now, that's how it works. You can do them. Now, there is one other element of fair usage, and that is to not bring the original into disrepute. So if I did a parody and just swore all over it and cursed and did really political, controversial views all over it, then yes, that could very well be challenged and asked to be taken down. But because they're always fun, there's always a key message behind it. I've never had any issues like that. So I don't swear in anything I've ever done on social media, ever. I'm very aware of my brand and my audience and the kind of PG element of what I do because also I am, I am a professional. So I don't want to jeopardize any of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Neil, so Al, are you, why are you, are you thinking of doing one, Al? No, I can't sing at all, but I just, I just wanted to know, just being noting. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing that Al made a really good comment before, Mill, is would Botox be good for you? <laughs> absolutely never. I mean, the eyebrows are a huge part of my act. They are my backing dancers. <laughs> they come everywhere with me and they often do without they don't even know what they're doing sometimes they just get uh, absorbed into the music and off they go um <laughs> so how to use their eyebrows didn't i see I've, something yes i've already seen the genetics are strong in them so i think you know con control of your frontalis and corrugators is something that can only come with years of practice, I believe. So my mum, so growing up, my mum could always do this. And there's kind of like a Persian style dance where you sort of, it's, it's like a very slow dance it's called Baba Karam. And it's a very slow dance and the eyebrows kind of do a lot of work. And my mum could always do that quite well. And it's a kind of, you know, very fun, like cheeky sort of, slightly seductive type of dance. And um, my mum could always do that and she could sort of do it at parties and all the rest of it. And I kind of watched that and then I just started sort of practicing. And then I'm, I'm able to kind of, do, do the corners, do the middle, do individual. I can actually do a corrugator at a time. Look at that. Bosh. Wow. So yeah, I've got a lot of movement in the face. Um, and thankfully, I've got quite decent skin because doing all this stuff I do, I don't have a roadmap currently on the forehead, which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> let's see how that develops over the years. But yeah, yeah no, Botox would, would fully kill that for me, unfortunately. Um, so yes, I've, actually, I've got friends that have threatened to do that in my sleep, just to ruin my life. <laughs> or shave your eyebrows off, or shave your eyebrows yeah, or shave. off. Actually, I did look at insuring them, because I heard, you know, J-Lo insured her butt. So I was like, well, I should insure my eyebrows. There's such a major, if I open the oven door too quick, I'm stuffed. So I thought, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought let, let, me, let me try, and, but no, it, it didn't work. But yes, there's another element, actually, my beard, my very coiffed beard. So this look I have, I think, that's helped a lot with the sort of, you know, elements of what I do as well, because the bald head, beard, eyebrows, and big nose, that's sort of become a look of the singing dentist and people can kind of spot that. And I get recognized a lot now, I guess, because of this characteristic work. Now with this PPE, these FFP3 masks that create a seal around your face to not allow the aerosol in and all the rest of it, you can't do that with a beard. So I've got my fit testing coming up in the next three or four days. I'm dreading having to shave this beard. Because if I have to clean shave, I will literally look like an egg with eyebrows. And that, <laughs> that is going to ruin the brand. So I don't know, I might, I might try and get some kind of like Zorro style um, goatee for a little while and see how that goes down. But yeah, well, we shall like see. That, like that Mr. Potato Head you had as a child where you put the big eyebrows on it. Yes, and you could change him, chop and change. That's literally how I'm going to end up looking, Mr. Potato. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the, what's the future for you, Hold? You've got your clinic, um, yeah. uh, Mill, you've got the, the, the sort of media career. Which way do you think you're going to go? How are you going to mix that up? So I've always kind of gone with the flow. That's been a very opportunity to come my way over the last five years that I've said no to because they just didn't feel right. And I believe I've always made great decisions with those things. There's a lot of stuff still coming that is actually planned. So on the dental kind of side, um, I'm involved in something called avant-garde dentistry, which basically is a way of edu education. It's a practice development type thing that really can help elevate the way that dentists are doing a lot of stuff, especially in the smile makeover and the cosmetic world. 
Um, and we're really going to be doing some exciting stuff. So that's definitely something in the pipeline and something I'll be keeping everybody uh, in tune with. I've got some dental products coming out. They've been about three years in the making. So we have toothpaste, brushes, all the kind of usual stuff, but um, they all have some USBs. And that's why I've been taking my time to really bring it up. Literally three years now we've been planning this. Uh, well, actually 2016, so coming up to four years, but um, it's now finally ready. So I'll be sharing that with people soon. Um, I'm kind of partway through writing a book, believe it or not. So that's happening. Um, and I guess it's a mixture of everything. There, there will always be some dentistry involved because I'm the dentist guy. You know, if I suddenly just became a singer, that I don't think would work as well because there's loads of those around and they're all pretty good. Um, so there'll always be some dental element. But then on the flip side, music is a massive part of my life. And actually, I am working on some music projects. Um, I am rekindling some of the like performance stuff I was doing. So all through lockdown, I saw, because I used to DJ, all through lockdown, I thought I'd do some live DJ sets because that became very popular. Lots of people were doing that. So every Saturday night, because no one could go out, I did a sort of DJ set from my conservatory and we called it Club Conservatoire. <laughs> and it did unbelievably well. I can't believe the amount. Like I was getting kind of more views and more people watching than actual proper credible DJs were. But, you know, I, I was a DJ. So it's not like I've just picked this up, you know, three months ago because of lockdown. I've, did it for, I've done it for years, probably since I was about 18. I've been DJing, so about 21 years. And... It was just so much fun and I kind of do, you know, I'm performing while I'm doing it. So it's not so much as the boring kind of DJ set. And it, it, that really rekindled a lot of fun times for me. So who knows? When we're back to doing events, I might take Club Conservatoire on the road. Yeah. And where um, can people find Club Conservatoire, Dil? So it's all on my Facebook page. So I did them all on Facebook Live. So if you go to Facebook and search for The Singing Dentist, thankfully there's not many of us around. Uh, you'll probably find me there. Um, and just on, on any social platforms, really. So Instagram, I'm, I'm there, you know, singing dance. I've even got a TikTok now. I'm even doing dick TikToks in my room, dancing away, like trying to keep up with these young kids out there. But it's a lot of fun. What do your kids, how old are your kids? And what do your kids and family think of all this? So very interesting. My daughter is six uh, and my son is four. And my wife, um, we've been together since I was 21. So a long time. She's kind of been there through everything well before that. But she was there right when I was doing my music stuff at the start, all through dental school, then the whole singing dentist thing. So she very much knows my personality, knows my passions, knows what music means to me. Um, so she's super supportive and, and the total opposite to me. Like Mrs. SD, I call her. She won't get on the camera. She won't even say something. If I'm filming something and she's there, she won't even talk. Like she's so away from it, which I think works so beautifully well. Because if it didn't, it would be, it would be a, a kind of weird dynamic. And she is so, because we've been together so long, there is no yes man business from her. She keeps it 100. If I do something, I always bet it. So I'll do a song. I play it to my daughter first. If she doesn't watch the whole thing and she swipes after about 10, 20 seconds, it's a no-go. So she's the first filter. If I can engage with a six-year-old, and I've been doing this since she was about three, if, if you can keep a three-year-old's attention, you're doing well. So that's the first one. Then it'll be my wife. What do you think of this, babe? And if she's like, dude, you look like an idiot, then that's usually a good sign. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky that she's so supportive of everything I'm doing and kind of takes a lot of care of a lot of, a lot of the things in the background that enables me to do what I'm doing. So yeah, the fam and my dad, my mom and dad, they've always seen the music side of me massively, but they kind of encouraged me more towards the dentistry thing because my dad has been a musician and, and you know he knows it can be a very tough kind of industry to break to get into to stay in um, he was always very much about the education but now that i'm able to kind of combine the two and have been doing he's so super proud and it's it's a nice feeling for me to know that my parents are so supportive of everything i'm doing and very kind of encouraging and stuff so i'm an only child so you know for, for, for me family is super kind of important and yeah i'm very blessed i'm very blessed definitely Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. That 40 minutes has gone so fast. I wonder if we My could... Goodness. Have, is it possible? What do you think, Al? Would you... Uh, what, what do you think? Brilliant. And I think maybe when you... Um, have, you got, have you got an idea of what your next big song is going to be? Or you don't need to sort of wait to see what it, the charts do? Yeah, I always kind of wait. So, I mean, I did, I did the coronavirus song right at the start of the thing, which I didn't... Again, I didn't want to do because I, I didn't want it to come across like, oh, I'm taking a mickey out of corona or kind of making light of something that's so serious. But I had there were some key elements that I wanted to get across to people as well. And that's kind of how I do it. So the virus baby came out and that did really well. That, that again, kind of kicks, you know, went globally viral again while there was a global virus going on. Um, and this PPE one, again, that just came out of necessity. I think some people were confused about it. And actually I had loads of comments saying, Oh, you know, my kids have just gone to the dentist and they were terrified because these, 
these things now make us look a bit alarming. Like if you're not used to seeing that and you walk in, your dentist literally gowned up with this massive ninja mask mm. on. You lose all, so much facial is so important to building that rapport immediately. And that smile you give a patient and the warm welcome, when they're literally seeing you looking like some Darth Vader slash ninja, it's impossible to get that rapport immediately. So I, I felt it was important. So I, I, I really just wait. I wait and see kind of what is current, what people kind of, I feel they might need a little bit something with. And I, and I sort of do a parody on it. So I don't actually know what the next one is, if I'm honest. But at the start of the lockdown, I did have a song. So that was available. So we finally did. So in answer to your question, we finally cleared one of the songs. We got permission from the original artist and the record label. And it was a parody of I Like To Move It mm. by Real To Real off of the 90s. But also, you see, the kids know it because it's in Madagascar. Right. Mm. So I thought this would be great. And I'd, I'd already done the parody about three years ago and it really well, had about 50 million views. And I thought, let's bring that out. So a, a record label approached me to do a song and I said, yeah, well, I think this could work quite well. So we remixed I Like To Move It, um, made it a bit more kind of current and housey. And I called it I Like Your Molars. <laughs> and um, we brought it out and we brought it out at the start of lockdown and all the money raised from the track is going to the NHS charities together. So it was due to come out in summer and be like a bubbly summer record, but I wanted to bring it out and donate all the money. So that's out. That's on my YouTube page. There's a music video for that. That was fun. I literally shot it in this room. I put a green screen up here and shot myself in front of it. And then my friend edited it into a video. So yeah, I like your molars. I can give you a little burst of that. Yeah, you know, come like, on. Get, uh, Mill, can you, you give us a... You have to sing along though. You have to sing along uh, towards the end. You'll, yeah, you'll okay. get the lyrics. It's dead easy. Okay, we're, we're ready. You ready? So, I like your molars, molars. I like your molars, molars. Come I on. like your molars, molars. We like your molars, molars. 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 There you go. It's, it's a single old classic. It's a party <laughs> hit. <laughs> Have you got, before we go, Mill, could you give us a, yeah. just a quick medley of some of your top tunes? Okay, so there was, I like your molars. There was um, Return of the Plaque. There it is, Return of the Plaque. That was a good one. Um, thriller, um, mm. you'll need a filler. That came out, that was, that was quite fun. Um, also another Michael Jackson classic, uh, you wanna be starting something, but I called it, I said, you wanna do some tooth whitening, you want to do some teeth whitening, so see your dentist and do whitening. That was good fun. Um, what else? Obviously the Take a Seat, one of my favorites. Um, 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 what else? Is Gappy. Yeah. Gappy. Gappy, that was the first ever one, and Sweet Eater. Those two have a very special place in my heart because they were the first ones I've really kind of crafted. So Gappy was good. Um, Sweet Eater, blimey, I've got so many. I, I'm probably forgetting some, some gems, but yeah, I've, I've, done, I've lost track of how many of these things I've done now. I could do an album, a Christmas album is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, and like I said earlier, Adrian, I think we're gonna enter the podcast series into aesthetic um, initiative of the year, and I think you should come and do our thank acceptance speech, should we win? Oh my. That would be an honor and a privilege, and we could come up with some kind of medley. Maybe yeah. Barbie Girl. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's brilliant. You could have your eyebrows and Adrian and I as also your backing artists. We're there. I mean, it's a done deal. It's a what, done deal. What a team. You know what, Adrian? We might win now just because of this, because people will want to see Dr. Mill. Yeah. And aesthetic awards. So I think we've played. I see what you've done. <laughs> I see all of that getting me on here. <laughs> you're, our, you're our secret weapon, Mill. Well, Mill, well, thank you very much. That's been absolutely brilliant. So I'm going to come and see you to get my teeth sorted out. I'm uh, going to go down because I need a dentist too. And thanks, Mill, because I know I harassed you and tracked you down. I didn't really let you. Not at all. No, no, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, guys. It's been really, really great. Lovely to see you. Guys. Have a great Take day. Care. Bye. All the best.